Uh, so welcome everyone to our second webinar um, presented by Onkapringa Libraries. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, Dimix Glenelg uh, for stocking Imbi's book. So if you don't want to put it on hold through the library, uh, you can head down to Dimmicks or give them a call at Glenelg and they have some stock of Imbi's book. And you can either come into the library, phone us or do it online if you want to put a copy on hold. I'd also like to thank Penguin Random House uh, for allowing us to have Imbi with us today. And of course, I'd like to thank Imbi for being with us today. Uh, in today's webinar, you'll be able to ask um, questions of Imbi through the question and answers button uh, at the bottom of your screen. So if you can't see that, you can hover your mouse over it and it'll pop up. Um, and then we've got Eve with us today, who's co-hosting. Hi. <laughs> and I'm Angela. Uh, so Eve will be um, presenting the questions from you guys to Imbi when um, Imbi's finished her talk. So on that note, I'd like to welcome Imbi today and thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Angela. Um, and I, I've just realised I've gone to share my screen and it's... Uh, it's disabled for sharing. So I think, yeah, I think there's a little side button on the side. Um, okay, we didn't check that beforehand, did we? We were... Yes. You should be okay now, MB. Cool, thank you, Eve. There we go, I can start. Um, oh, hang on, I'll just, actually, I, I didn't, it's like, it's like taking off uh, in an Apollo spaceship. There's, you know, all the buttons that you have to, <laughs> and I didn't do com share computer sound. I'm, at least I realized my mistake now. Um, okay, hi everybody. My name is Imbi Nini. Um, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land that I'm on at the moment. It's, it's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I wanna pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I particularly want to do this because storytelling has always been at the heart of their lives on this land, this land where I live, where I write and where I share my own stories. So um, I am in Binimi, author type person. Um, this presentation, you're getting a slightly longer version, like the 12 inch mix. Um, there, uh, I've been giving versions of this presentation a lot. So in today's presentation, there is one slide that I've done um, purely for you guys, for this audience, um, and it contains a bold lie about myself. And I wonder, I wonder if you'll be able to pick which one that is. Anyway, we'll, we'll go on. So most people are under the, the um, belief that this is my first novel, that this is a debut novel, but it's actually not. Um, my first book um, I wrote when I was five, and it was published in my school magazine. Um, and I remember how excited I was to have written so many words, to have written this whole book. And then later, of course, I realized it wasn't a book. It was a single sentence. And that sentence, I'll do a, a reading now for you. The funny planet. One day a man went to a planet and explored it and a rocket came and a funny turkey came out and asked if he would join in a party in his rocket. Imbi Nimi, year one. So what a sentence, right? What a sentence. Um, but that, that really hooked me into this whole writing thing. From then on, I actually, I felt like I was a writer at my core. I did a lot of writing in my teenage years in uh, a lot of different journals, a lot of um, complaining about my parents and, you know, um, about boys who didn't love me back and, um, and some torturous poetry. Um, this is an actual photo of my diaries and I apologise for the language I see. <laughs> I only realised the other day that there was a sentence in there with a square word. So sorry, just, you know, um, if you're under 18, avert your eyes. Um, uh, I, um, only a handful of these actually remain. So I think we should all be grateful particularly me, that only a few remain. Um, and then when I had finished university, um, I kind of stopped journaling every day and turned my mind towards actually writing um, properly, but wrote an earnest and probably quite terrible novella while I was teaching English in Japan on a power book very much like this one, um, which I like to describe as being more house brick than computer. Um, 
it was a really derivative uh, novella. I really felt that I was the Australian Jeanette Winterson. Um, but the, the good thing that came out of this was that my dad, who doesn't read a lot of um, fiction, he's uh, more of a non-fiction reader and he's, he's a theatre director, um, he, so he reads plays, he read it and he said to me, Imbi, I think you found your bliss. I, I found the thing that, you know, um, I did best and made me happiest. And I felt, yeah, that's right, Dad. I'm a writer. And, you know, I thought I was on my way. Except I then entered my own personal dark ages, which, you know, um, which spanned over 12 years. Um, I wrote virtually nothing between the ages of 25 and 37. Um, except for a few short film um, courses that I did. Um, I was busy trying to have a career. I got married. I had three children. But all that time, I still identified as a writer, even though I did virtually no writing. And then finally, after my third child was born, I started writing again. Um, a friend encouraged me after I'd written a few too many long posts on Facebook to start a blog. And after I'd Googled, what is a blog? Um, I signed up for WordPress and started Not Drowning Mothering, where I wrote between 2008 and 2011. Very, very active on that blog, writing five posts a day and generating over 270,000 words for um, over 50,000 unique visitors. So that was pretty successful. Um, I, during this time, I would get up at five o'clock in the morning and I would write and then um, between sort of like 6.30 and 9, um, I'd be having, I'd have small children dangling off me like Christmas ornaments. Um, but while I was getting the kids ready for uh, kindergarten and school, I'd be still revising and, and publishing. And then I would spend the rest of the day um, thinking about the next day's blog. So it was this kind of cycle that I went through for, you know, a, a, a good um, number of years. And, and during that time, I really developed this sort of muscle that allowed me to make the best use of whatever time I was given, no matter how short that, that little window of opportunity was. So I'm able to sort of, um, there's no easing into things. I just go in, I go hard, and then I move on. So um, I'm very grateful for my blogging days. Um, and then I started in 2013 to, um, to write some long form fiction, which was always my dream. I mean, I'd hoped that the blog would um, lead to sort of, you know, getting a publishing contract. The only attention I got from publishers were people who wanted nonfiction publishers wanting to turn the blog into a book. And my heart was really in ultimately writing fiction. So I pushed the blog aside and I, I started um, to write my first paragraph of my first manuscript in 2013 in this very restaurant, which is the Cornucopia restaurant in Dublin, where I was visiting with my, um, my partner. Um, it took a whole other year before I wrote the second paragraph of my first manuscript. But, you know, we won't go into that. Um, this photo wasn't actually taken... Um, after I'd written my first manuscript uh, paragraph, it that would have been a bit weird if I wrote a paragraph and then went outside and went, hey, take a photo now, let's mem remember this moment. Um, this is actually taken five years later and actually three whole manuscripts later, including the first draft of The Spill. Um, so it was in June 2018. And at this moment, I was still nine months away from winning the Penguin Literary Prize. Um, so how did I get here? Um, from this point, um, from, for, well, from writing that first paragraph. Well, I submitted my work every, everywhere. Like I threw my work at, <laughs> at absolutely everything in the hope it would stick somewhere. Um, this is my submission spreadsheet where I would log every single submission I did, whether it was for a short story competition or a, um, it was for, um, you know, an unpublished manuscript award or I was submitting to a publisher or um, querying a literary agent. Um, if you notice the long grey column there, um, that is uh, all the greys represent where I was unsuccessful, rejected, or I didn't hear, like eventually I just had to give it up for dead. Um, I just didn't hear anything. Um, and the, the yellow represents where I was shortlisted or longlisted, and the, um, the green represents where I've had a, a win. So, you know, I always tell people like behind every success, there's at least, you know, a hundred rejections. So it's very easy when you see people winning things and 
you know, um, getting accolades to think that that's what their whole life is about. No, there's, they've generally had to be rejected a lot to get to that point. But it wasn't a straightforward path for me to publication because I had a few detours along the way. Um, by the end of 2017, um, I'd had too many grey cells in my spreadsheet and I, um, I pivoted long before, you know, pivoting became hashtag so hot right now. Um, I turned back to writing short stories. I hadn't written a short story for 25 years, but I, I really needed to reconnect with my love of writing. You know, I love writing, but I hate I hated trying to get published. And I also wanted to get a couple of quick wins. Um, so I was astounded um, when I started to, you know, get shortlisted for some prizes and actually win some. And this is a, this is a photo that was taken um, just after I'd won first prize in the Borondara Literary Awards here in Melbourne, um, much to my surprise. Um, by the end of 2018, I'd had so much success with my short story writing that I decided to actually put my two uh, three manuscripts, sorry, aside and focus on building up a short story collection in 2019. That was my plan. And I'd pretty much forgotten that I'd even entered the Penguin Literary Prize when I got the email saying I'd been shortlisted. Around that same time, something else sort of changed for me. And to explain this, I have to go back to 2015 when I started working alongside these two magnificent human beings um, in a small arts organisation here in Melbourne. Um, but only the one in the middle is relevant to this story. So, so sorry, Tim, um, this isn't about you. So the magnificent human being in the middle is my friend, Emily Collier. We were both writers and working for this arts organisation. Um, and we used to swap our war stories out, you know, share our disappointments and our wins. And by about two, October 2015, I'd had some good luck with my first manuscript and was feeling pretty close to maybe getting a publishing contract. Um, so in this sort of, sort of mood of optimism, I suggested to Emily um, that we should both both kind of make a pact, enter a pact with each other, that if we achieved certain goals within the next year, we'll go and get matching tattoos, right? So at this stage, I'm like 45, I have no tattoos. Um, I always thought maybe I'll get a tattoo, but I just suddenly had this urge, like, let's make this pact. And Emily, who's incredibly biddable, agreed on the spot, and we agreed that we would get an ampersand symbol, um, that would be, you know, the and sign, um, tattooed um, if we if we um, achieved these goals and we shook hands but then three weeks later um, Emily found out that she had breast cancer and her focus um, turned naturally away from writing and that goal that she'd set for herself and more towards her treatment and at one point during her treatment she confided in me and said she wasn't sure she would ever return to writing um, even after her treatment had ended and I tr tried to be supportive but you know I felt really worried for her because it was one thing to be a writer who didn't write, which is something that I had done a lot of, but to be a writer who no longer even said that they were a writer, that kind of seemed bleak to me. Um, but, you know, I did support her. Now, the story has a happy ending. Um, I, I want to just add here, um, Emily finished her treatment and is now in remission. And she started to write about her treatment and then some other things and then more and more. And then she came back to writing fully. Um, and through Emily's journey, I realised that the symbol of the ampersand, the, the tattoo that we were going to get, was not about a particular achievement. It was more about a commitment to writing, to the writing that we had already done, the writing we were doing now, and the writing that we would always do. So even though neither of us had achieved the goals we'd originally set for ourselves, two years after we'd made that pact, we went and got the tattoos anyway. And ta-da! <laughs> For the record, it hurt a lot. <laughs> and here is um, a close-up of the tattoos. One is a novelty tattoo that we had for my friend Jane's birthday and one is the actual tattoo. I think you can guess which one's which. So before I could went, went on um, to win the Penguin Literary Prize, there was one more detour for me to take. Yes, I toured with the Backstreet Boys in their 2015 reunion tour. Okay. <clears throat> That's enough detours. Um, now we're going to come to the best bit of the story. Winning the Penguin Literary Prize. So just to recap, I'd given up on my novels for the moment, but I'd made a renewed commitment to writing. 
Um, I was freshly inked badass and I was ready to jump into my short story con collection when I got the news that I was shortlisted. And that was, I was one of five out of a total of about 400 manuscripts. And then I had to wait, um, you know, I had to wait, I think about a month. And, you know, I was thinking that entire time, you know, when will I get the, the news? Will it come? Will it be a telephone call? Will it be an email? Does the winner already know and I'm waiting in vain? Will they, you know, tell us on the day or a week beforehand? Um, and all that time I was just bracing myself for disappointment because I'd been in this position a number of times and it was never my name. I was totally prepared for it to be somebody else. So when I got the email on a Sunday afternoon when nobody expects to get an email of consequence, um, I was absolutely flabbergasted. Um, I, I, my stepdaughter was explaining the plot of The Shining to her sister and I gasped so loudly when I read Meredith's Kerno, who's now my publisher, her email saying, you know, how, how do you feel about winning the Penguin Literary Prize? Um, I gasped so loudly that my stepdaughter thought she would just spoilt the ending to The Shining for me. Um, so she hadn't. And um, my answer to Meredith's question is, I feel really, really good about winning the Penguin Literary Prize. So we immediately abandoned all our plans for the day and went out to have lunch. And during that lunch, I went to the bathroom and I saw my reflection properly for the first time since I found out that I'd won the prize. And I thought, I have to take a photo. I'm not one for bathroom selfies, but this is the bathroom selfie that I took. Um, you can see that I am super, super, super excited. And then I had to sit on that feeling for two weeks. I wasn't allowed to tell anyone. And then I was able to fly to um, Adelaide, um, hello Adelaide, um, on the 17th of March to receive the prize at the Leading Edge Books Conference. So here is another photo of how I looked just before I went into the event and there with my friend Kate who dropped me off. We're both kind of beside ourselves. Um, I met Meredith Kerno, my now publisher, for the first time outside the event. And as we walked in, she said, oh, so do you want to... I want to say a few words and I was I panicked because no one said I'd have to make a speech and so I was going to decline but then when I um when I uh saw the room full of independent booksellers the people that would be selling my book um and there was actually an ex-prime minister in the room as well Malcolm Turnbull um who was I think trying to sell his biography or his autobiography um I thought, this is where it begins. This is where I become a capital A author. So I've got to rise to this occasion. So I stood at the lectern and I babbled incoherently for a few minutes and um, although it felt like hours. And then I ended my speech by waving cheerfully to the crowd and saying, it's nice to meet you all. Like exactly like that. And my kids still really tease me about it. But, you know, I won the Penguin Literary Prize, kids. So, you know, who's laughing? Um, so what happened next? My winning manuscript entered the editing process and people are often surprised like, oh, but it won the prize. Like surely there'd be nothing to do. But actually there was. First there was the structural edit, which is kind of the big picture edit. Um, and, you know, this is a, a scene from um, Minority Report, but it was sort of looking at it, the big picture. I was very fortunate I didn't have to change too many structural things, um, but I did, it's like a, a mixing desk where I was bringing up some levels and bringing down other levels. So um, I, I was very lucky too to have a two week residency in the Blue Mountains at, at Varuna. And um, so I was able to really sort of focus on that uh, in a way that I wouldn't if I was back home working and dealing with five teenagers, it's a whole other thing. Um, one of the things I did was I read the entire manuscript out loud when I was in the Blue Mountains because I heard that was a really good way to make sure that the language was flowing. And that was really good advice, except I did it at totally the wrong time because the next stage of editing was just around the corner, the copy edit phase. Now, the key to this document is if you see all the red and the blue, the, the red equals um, the editor's sort of notes or changes and the blue represents the tears of the author. Um, I describe this process um, as being a bit, bit like 
a masterclass in your own writing. That's, you can't hide anything from your editor. They are going, they're doing a deep dive at your language, at continuity of errors, inconsistencies. My, my lovely editor, Genevieve Buzo, really kind of, um, she whipped me up into shape. And I discovered that all my characters um, are always sighing and looking down at their hands and their feet and with a tight feeling in their chest. Um, I was embarrassed by how many times people had a tight feeling in their chest. And for the record, there are still characters with tight feelings in their chest, but just not as many in the final book. And then after that, I went into the proofreading stage. Um, and this, you know, I hope you appreciate my Photoshop skills. So I've put some glasses on this um, bit of clip art. Um, the proofreading stage was done by an external proofreader who, um, who had kind of like fresh eyes on the page, which was good because Genevieve and I were very close to the work by then, too close to be able to see errors. Um, so this is the last point where you can really make any changes. Um, and here's a brief diary of what it was like for me doing the proofread stage. Day one, there's not really that many changes. Day three, why are there so many changes? Day seven, the timeline is completely wrong. Day nine, my words are setting like concrete. Day 12, I don't even know what a comma is anymore. Um, it was amazing to go through that. And uh, I should add here that I actually got married in between the copy editing and the proofreading stage. So um, for future authors, I would not recommend doing that because it makes for a very intense life. So then finally, I... Um, I submit and it goes off and COVID-19 happens and I start thinking that maybe my book is not going to be printed, that it's going to be turned into the paper is going to be used for toilet paper instead. And then one day in late April, a box arrives and this is actually what happened. It's stuck there, Indy. I think it's not like back to the future. Hey, George, this just arrived. Uh, what is it? <laughs> it's, it's for you, Mr. It's McFly. It's for no. you, Mr. McFly. It's, it's for you. Oh. What is it? What is it? So that, people, is how it is to be almost 50 and holding your life's ambition, your actual novel in your hands. It was, I get a bit teary even just watching that. Um, oh, okay. All right. Oh, I was a sneak preview of the next slide. I hope everyone can unsee that. So here we have The Spill. The elevator pitch for this book is no two people ever experience or remember the same thing in the same way, especially when they're sisters. Um, one of the first questions people ask me about the book is, does it really come with a free cup of tea? And the answer is no, think about it. The logistics, quite impossible. Um, but you know, after people get over their disappointment, um, the answer to that um, question, oh, the next question, sorry, is what inspired the book? Um, and the answer to that is a complex one because a book is like the most complicated recipe you could ever try and make. Um, and it's really hard to single out one hero kind of ingredient. That's the terminology, isn't it? Um, uh, and um, if I had to reduce it to one thing, it was the car crash that I was in when I was 10. Um, I remember waiting for the ambulance alongside the road and looking back at the car and thinking, car's fine, we'll be able to drive home in it later. And then later, after we'd been to the hospital and I, you know, had a couple of stitches and everyone's checked out and we're all fine, um, we saw the car in the wrecking yard where it'd been towed and it was completely totaled. And I think for me, um, the accident was like that. I, I, on the outside, was fine, but actually I felt the impact of that accident for decades afterwards. I, I think I still feel it to this day. It fundamentally changed something about me and the way I see or experience the world. And, um, and I, I got interested in exploring those moments that a, a person's life can kind of pivot or turn. Um, and I put two fictitious sisters in the car instead and their fictitious mother and started to imagine like, you know, where, where have they come from? Like, where are they going? Why did the accident happen? And what's gonna happen next? So that was kind of the starting point. 
And here is um, an obligatory fuzzy felt tableau that I made of the car. You can see it's upended. Um, the mother, Tina, is drinking at the Bruce Rock pub um, and the two sisters, Nicole and Samantha, are rushing to greet their father, Craig, who's just driven all the way from Perth to pick them up. So the themes of this um, book are sisters, because I find the sister relationship incredibly, incredibly interesting. Um, I've got two sisters, got lots of friends with sisters, and over the years I've just collected like a bower bird, um, all these kind of shiny stories of miscommunication, misunderstanding, tension, resentment, jealousy, but also of great love and like this sort of amazing loyalty that can happen between sisters. Um, and then the second theme is memory, because I'm really interested in that gap between what we experience at the time and what we kind of choose to remember. I think we all fictionalise our memories to a certain degree over time. We sort of twist and bend them into shapes so they fit the narratives that we want to tell ourselves about our lives. And then the third theme is alcoholism, um, which is not something I set out to write about. It was something that sort of organically happened through Tina, the mother, one of the characters who was an alcoholic. It's a trigger warning. Um, but um, I didn't want it to be a kind of a didactic sort of like alcohol is bad sort of book. I wanted to kind of look at the many different ways in which people have relationships, sometimes good, sometimes bad with alcohol. Um, so they're the three themes. Then we come to the structure or why I like to make things incredibly difficult for myself. Um, I describe the structure of the spill as being like a jigsaw puzzle of a club sandwich. So that's what's pictured here. And you're wondering, what does she mean by that? What could she possibly mean? Well, let me explain. The club sandwich metaphor comes from this idea that I had where I wanted to start the book immediately after the accident, have the middle of the book be the actual accident itself and have the end of the book being um, the time just before the accident. So if you think about the book like a club sandwich, those three chapters are the, uh, the three layers of bread. I then wanted to have like a present day narrative. This was the meat of the story. And then I wanted um, that to be punctuated with chapters from the past, which are the lettuce and mayo and uh, tomato. And that would slowly build up a, a picture or a sandwich of how the two sisters in the story were impacted by the car accident. Um, you may be pleased to know that's where the club sandwich metaphor ends. So with those past chapters, I treat it like a huge jigsaw puzzle. So my head is a bit like my, um, my underwear drawer. Everything's kind of tangled up, but the socks are separated. The bra's kind of gotten uh, wrapped around something. Um, so uh, I, I, I also think it was like unconnected jigsaw pieces in my head. Um, I think it felt like a really good literary device. So I, I, I thought about handing the reader one piece at a time from different parts of the puzzle so that slowly they would be able to form the bigger picture and sort of understand more about these two sisters, how, how they've become who they've become and, um, you know, where they could possibly go next. So how did I manage to write this? Time for another spreadsheet, of course. Um, on the left-hand side, um, the columns allowed me to look at the chapters that I'd written in the order that they appeared in the book, but then I could also sort it so I could see them in chronological order in the order that they actually happened in the, the girls' lives. And I was able to track um, over on the right the ages of the, um, the main characters, where they were living, and um, the bit that I've kind of greyed out, I've, or sort of blurred out, sorry, um, that's how I kind of uh, tracked... Um, that each chapter was earning its place in the story, that um, I like to think of the book as being a whole heap of micro mysteries and um, each chapter has to kind of introduce um, further or resolve one of those little mysteries, um, which could be like, why was um, Nicole not invited to be Samantha's um, um, bridesmaid um, at her wedding? Or um, why does Nicole own that terrible cookie monster jar? So then, Coming to the end of the presentation, you'll be pleased to know. Um, in summary, uh, The Spill is about sisters, it's about memory, and it's about alcoholism, and it's like a sandwich that is a jigsaw and that is managed by a giant overcomplicated spreadsheet. So um, I suggest that you, um, you 
reserve it at the library or um, you go to your local bookshop because they need your business right now and get a copy at once so you can understand what, what I mean by all of this. And then I say thank you. Thank you, City of Onkaburinga Libraries, for having me. And that is the end of my odyssey. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. That was really interesting. Uh, I have a few questions because I have got the book here and I have read it. Um, with, <laughs> with the car accident, obviously in the book there's a car accident and in your life there's a car accident. Is there any other parallels in the book between the journey of the sisters and you? Look, no. I think there's a couple of little incidents, things that happened to me in my childhood that I have sort of like cannibalized or sort of you know borrowed um but largely it it is kind of i always you know i use the car accident as just of a springboard and quickly moved away from real life because i didn't want legal action from members of my family um but um yeah I, there's one one particular chapter which is about a failed sleepover which actually did happen to me where uh, um uh the girl that I desperately wanted to come for a sleepover didn't feel comfortable in our house. And it might not have been my house looking back and, and my own kids are doing sleepovers now. Um, and I realised it's not always just about the, the girl who's invited the other girl for a sleepover, but I really took it personally and felt so rejected. And so I, it was, I felt it good, felt good to write about that. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, with the, your, like, the relationship of the two sisters, it was so realistic reading it. Um, I have two sisters myself and I know you go through times where you're arguing and then you're all happy but at the end you are really loyal to each other regardless of what's going on Absolutely. is that like is that what it's like with your sisters as well yeah um, I, I have two sisters one's four years younger than me and she lives um, on in New South Wales and the other sister is 19 years younger than me she's actually my half sister um, she lives in London. And so, you know, over the years, there's been times where I've been closer to one sister than the other. And, you know, um, but yeah, at, at, at the base of all of that, it's just this love. And I mean, the book is dedicated to them both. It's, it's my love letter to the sister relationship because, you know, I explore all of the frustrations and that can happen or the, those, those moments, those really kind of pointy moments. But I also like to think, you know, I also, I also explore the, the love, that love, that, you know, oh, that love that happens between sisters. So The other thing I really liked in the book, the theme, obviously you've touched on it a little bit, is um, perspective um, and being able to put yourself in other people's shoes. So throughout the book, you, you know, the chapters of, you know, with the different sisters and um, I really liked that aspect. Uh, was that part of your intention to have that overriding theme of um, perspective and putting yourself in each other's shoes? Yeah, well? I, I think that I think um, it's definitely something that I'm always been interested in is other other people's take on a thing that I'm looking at because I know that we all look at the world through different lenses, and so those kind of judgments that we make or those sort of um, where sometimes we're very quick to dismiss people. Um, and I think we, we need more and more to stop before we judge or act and actually think about the other side. And um, yeah, so that I, I definitely wanted to explore that. Uh, uh, just a really funny question. I've just sprung in my head, but um, <laughs> do you do jigsaws at home? Because in your very last few yeah. pages, <laughs> that the very last few pages um you, the siblings uh, had a really good metaphor about the jigsaw and um about life which i thought was beautiful and i thought you've just mentioned jigsaws again so i thought you must have you must love doing jigsaws as well as mentioning in your book i love jigsaws and and look you know there was a point where i did toy with the idea of writing from the mother's perspective as well but Ultimately, I like the fact that she is like the missing piece in the puzzle. And actually, as the readers, we get to see one of those missing pieces that the actual sisters don't get to see. So we, you know, that piece will always be missing for them, but they can still see the rest of the puzzle, you know, because if one piece is missing, you can pretty much work out what was supposed to be there. <laughs> but um, yeah, I just like that idea of the mother being the missing piece. Oh, that's that's lovely. Okay, I'll hand over to Eve now and see if there's any questions from the audience. Yes, we've had a few questions come through. 
So, Imbi, when you have the idea for a book, how do you start writing it? Is it a fully formed story already or does it take shape as you're kind of going through the writing process? Um, I think I have this kind of phase which I call like the dreaming phase where, you know, it's like these little whispers and ideas and threads that I'm slowly like, again, the bowerbird collecting and, um, and then I start to think about a structure because I always have these sort of impossibly complex structures um I like to challenge myself um so I I kind of plot out as much as I can so sort of the the overview and then I start populating it slowly with all the materials that I've sort of gathered um in my notebooks and in my memory um but having said that when I when I sort of do that plotting or that sort of structuring I also acknowledge that that's just kind of the scaffolding and the actual building that I build might actually sort of grow in a different direction. I, I don't hold myself to that original sort of idea. So try and leave a little bit of flexibility in there and a little space to kind of discover things. Cause you always discover things when you're writing, you write something and go, Oh yeah, of course she would say that. Um, and that's always a really good feeling when the, the characters start to take on their own life and have their own sort of um, trajectory that you're not, just the puppet master they become a bit like the puppet master uh, puppets anyway <laughs> um, we've got another one so um, do you think you're going to continue to write books about families or try something different next time I think I look I always I write very close to my own life and experience um, which is not to say this is my life and experience but um, I'm not um, I'm one of those people who who I, yeah, I'm not good at imagining whole different things. Um, I'm good at taking things that are very close to my experience and sort of and manipulating them into fiction. I think it's that thing of um, I was talking about last night, which is, you know, uh, they say tragedy plus time equals comedy, but I feel like life plus time equals fiction. Um, so I can't write about things while they're happening, but after a few years of reflection and stuff, I feel like I can start to write. But um uh, now I can't remember what the question was, but you know, let's pretend I answered it really well. <laughs> you answered it perfectly for sure. <laughs> um, going on from that thing about family. Oh yeah, um, family. Oh yes. Yeah. So I was going to say, is my first manuscript was about marriages. Like, it was a, it's definitely about sort of long term relationships. My second book was about mothers and children. It's like um, it was childless mothers. And motherless children was the way that I described it. And so this one was about the sister relationship. The next book is about postcards. That's all I can say. Um, it's an idea that I've got that is kind of brewing and I'm just waiting to have some time to actually sit down and write it. Um, but look, it, always at the heart is family because I just, you know, we all have families, whether they're families that we were born into or families that we've chosen for ourselves. But all of those kind of, those dynamics and those sort of like, you know, uh, hot, hot points where little explosions and then sort of coming back together and understanding or sometimes like the irreparable rifts. I mean, it's all such great material and it's definitely where I'm interested in staying. Lovely. Now, another question has come through. Um, you're a mum of three, as you said, um, and very organised in your writing. I'm so impressed <laughs> by that spreadsheet. Thank you. Um, is, that, is that just how you naturally are? Have you had to build that skill over time? Um, I, most of my jobs have been as an administrator that will come as n not much of a surprise, I guess. Um, so I am quick, I'm quick to make a spreadsheet, you know, give me any task. If I think there's a spreadsheet needed for it, I'll be making it. Um, so I am reasonably organized. I, I kind of have to be organized with my writing. I don't have much choice because <clears throat> I have so little time to write. And we've got five teenagers in this house, got three sons and two stepdaughters and um you know they spread over three households but it's kind of it's a bit of a juggling act and the sort of just the management of the household and is very hard so um so those those opportunities i have to write i have to i can't just do the thinking while i've got that time i've got to do all the thinking so that the minute i get that chance i know exactly what i'm going to do so um, I start usually when I'm going into the world of a, a, a novel, I just do 250 words a day, which is not much, but can be quite hard at the very beginning of a story where you really just feel not sure of tone or 
voice or anything. And then slowly I gather momentum and then I increase that to 500 words a day. And as I like to tell people, I set that word limit for two reasons. Um, one is to kind of just, just so that it's, it's kind of always churning over in my mind. I'm just to have that daily contact with the story. And the other reason is um, so that I have a sense of achievement so that when I hit that word um, target, I, I'm allowed to then shut the computer without being angry at everybody and everything in the world that is not that manuscript because that's if I don't have that achievement, that sense of achievement, I just really, um, I really hate my life. <laughs> hate my kids, hate my husband, hate my job. Um, no, I just, you know, I, I, I'd love to have more time to write, but alas, life. It sounds like that routine's the way to go. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it saves everybody. Um, and it, people, you know, when, when I'm into that sort of that marathon stage of, of really going hard with that first draft, because that's always the most intense, um, everybody knows, all the kids, my husband know, just to kind of let me get to that word target and then then they can talk to me. <laughs> now, our last question that's come through, which I've been wondering myself about the origins of your very unusual name. Oh, that's a nice question. Um, my name uh, is, my full name is Imbi Merike Neme, but I say Imbi Nene. Um, and it is Estonian. My, my, dad, uh, my dad's family are um, originally from Estonia, which is part of the Baltic states near Lithuania and Latvia, across the Baltic Sea from Finland. Um, and, yes, for reasons unknown, my father um, inflicted the name Imbi on me and my mother, who I think had just gone through the trauma of childbirth, just agreed. Um, and I always thought it was a bit of a burden, but actually... Um, I recently in, in my launch speech, I reflected that my name combined with the fact that I changed school every two years. Like I, I went to eight different schools. Um, so sometimes there were, there was one year where I went to two different schools within that one year. Um, so the name and moving around and also then moving around in my job. So I've never stayed in a job more than two years, although I probably shouldn't say that too loudly because I'm about to come up to my two year anniversary, um, of my current job. Um, that, all over Australia and all over the world, there are people who have either been to school with or have worked with a chick called Imbi. And now I've got this big book, with my name in huge gold letters. And, you know, I've been building my brand for years, apparently, <laughs> through the trauma of being the new girl with a stupid name. <laughs> Excellent. Is that all the questions now, Eve? Yes, that's all the questions that have come through. Excellent. Thank you, people. Do you have time to read a few pages of your book? Oh, yes, I could do that. I could do that. Um, I will I'll read. I'll read. I'm going to read a different one from the one that I did last night. Um, although, it, am I going to be able to find it is the, uh, the thing. All right, no, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with this. Okay. <clears throat> When my father saw how wet I was, oh, I should give some context, shouldn't I? Context is everything. This is from Nicole's perspective. She's at the cemetery um, and getting a lift from uh, where her mother has just been buried, to her mother, Tina, and she's just getting a lift back to the wake with her father and his third wife, um, Celine. When my father saw how wet I was, he jumped out of his Lexus ES 350 and grabbed a towel from the boot. Thanks, Dad, I said, but the towel wasn't for me. It was for the back seat of his car. Celine was in the passenger seat, busy reapplying her makeup using the rear view mirror. Got to get my face back on, she said brightly as I climbed carefully into the back seat. Where's that lovely Prince Charming of yours? Oh, Jethro has gone ahead to deal with the caterers, I said, trying to straighten the towel underneath me. He's a keeper, that one. You can thank me at your wedding for getting you two together. I clenched my teeth and smiled politely. Jethro and I had been happily together for 10 years and yet Celine was still trying to push us down the aisle like it was 1955. Sure, I said. Even under all that makeup, Celine's face was looking pale and puffy in the reflection of the rear view mirror. I remembered Samantha's theory that Celine was trying to get pregnant. Maybe she was right after all. 
Finished, Celine announced, twisting the mirror back around to face the driver's side. Dad immediately readjusted it and then moved on to fussing with the powered wing mirrors. We were never going to leave at this rate. I had an urge to shake myself off like a dog all over Dad's precious upholstery. Was that Meg I saw at the funeral? Dad asked as he continued to fiddle with even more mirror-related knobs. Yeah, I said. I haven't seen her in more than 30 years. Who's Meg? Celine asked, now brushing her hair in long, decisive strokes. Tina's sister, Dad replied. Oh, is she the one doing the ugly crying? The one that looked like Tina, but, um, much younger? There's only two years between them, would you believe? Really? Meg must have a great skincare routine. Not to mention a fully functioning liver, I piped up and then immediately regretted it. It felt far too soon to be making light of mum's drinking. I, I thought it was good of Aunt Meg to come. To tell the truth, I'd been surprised she'd flown over from Melbourne for the funeral. She'd barely seen mum over the past three decades. But then I knew from my own experiences that sisters were sisters, no matter the time or distance. She had as much of a right to grieve as any of us. I'm so sorry for your loss, Celine said. She'd now turned in her seat to give me her full attention. Of course, I only met Tina a few times, but I do know this. She loved you and Samantha very much. It wasn't much consolation being told by my father's third wife that my dead mother loved me, especially when accompanied by the wear of the powered wing mirrors, but I knew Celine meant well. She wasn't the easiest person to know, I admitted. I could see the back of my father's head nod slightly, perhaps in agreement, or maybe he was still looking at the bloody mirrors. That's an excerpt from The Spill. Thank you very much, MB. Thank you for being with us today. For our audience, thank you also for Zooming in. Um, I will send out a link so you can give us some feedback and hopefully we can keep improving these events and having more author talks like this. Also, if you'd like to follow the Onkaringa Library's Facebook page, you'll find out other events that we're doing as well. Um, and we have another author talk coming up on the 29th of June, and that is Page Toon. Uh, so you can find that link on Eventbrite or on our Facebook page as well. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and I hope you've really enjoyed it. I certainly have. Uh, and once again, thank you to MB and Penguin, Penguin Random House. Thank you Thanks very so much. much. Thank you, Angela. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about myself. <laughs> <laughs> It was awesome. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thank you.